Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. Much of the dialogue around workforce development in the optics industry focuses on the progression from student to technician, and rightfully so. Each August in the education issue of Photonics Spectrum Magazine, and previously in All Things Photonics, we have spearheaded conversations with the changemakers whose efforts are shaping the equation that aims to build a robust pipeline of optics professionals. That equation, of course, does leave room to consider other perspectives. And on today's episode of the podcast, we bring you a dynamic one. Paul Malone, Global Optics Manufacturing Director at Thor Labs, is here to shed light on optics workforce development through an industry-first lens. Thor Labs, along with InRad Optics, Esco Optics, and Special Optics, all of which are New Jersey-based companies, are active partners with Sussex County Community College. In 2021, the college became the first institution to partner with the American Center for Optics Manufacturing, called Americom, under Americom's DOD-funded $34 million Defense Precision Optics Consortium Partnership. Pre-2021, Malone's efforts were instrumental in cultivating Thorlab's role as a partner promoting budding talent in the optics industry. Long a friend and ally of the Rochester Regional Photonics Cluster, Malone drew from the established Rochester model to help instill an industry-academia connection that is poised to benefit Thorlabs and others for years to come. That connection was further fortified earlier this year when Thorlabs announced its acquisition of Rochester-based JML Optical. With over 40 years of optics industry experience, Malone knows what optics manufacturers covet. From his own journey, he also knows how the optics shop has changed over the decades. The intricacies involved in ensuring technicians and engineers are positioned for success are ever-changing. One noticeable change is the way in which young talent is cultivated. More resources are critical to building a robust pipeline. But, as Malone says, it wasn't what kickstarted his life in optics and photonics in the late 1970s. I answered an ad in the paper. That was my introduction into optics and precision optics. And um, that was back in 1978. I saw the word laser in the uh, classified and I, I was like, wow, that's something I, I think I want to do. So, uh, you know, I, I ended up joining uh, a company called Laser Metrics back in Teaneck, New Jersey, like I said, in 1978. And I would say from that time, I, you know, I had worked there about four or five years. It was I was doing uh, pocal cell stuff and water soluble crystals and things like that. And I really learned a lot. A lot of different things, everything up into the polishing part, which I did end up learning later. And then I actually moved to a company called Special Optics, which they're still around. And the reason I bring these things up is that that was a really unique time, I thought, to be in optics as far as learning in the shop. And I always loved the fact that my 10 years at Special Optics, I was able to learn so many things that have really given me the uh, foundation for all, my entire career on on working on, you name it, like it, we did everything. It wasn't, there wasn't much centralization like there is now or, you know, very specific expertise or operations around certain optics, either materials or applications or whatever. So I, I often think about the company now or the shops I work in now and Sometimes you can get pigeonholed in an operation, and if if the company doesn't have a good program in place for you know workforce development and things like that, you can really get stuck. But um, when I think about you know optic shops then and optic shops now, obviously, right? There's uh, it's the tools and the metrology have come so far. It's really amazing and. I, I always wonder and I not, I kind of worry about, you know, are we building this workforce of um, button pushers? And oh, I hope we're not. I know what I see with the people I work with uh, at Thor Labs, we try to really do a good job of having them understand the um, 
the foundational stuff for making a lens or making a window or a prism, um, you know, so it isn't, or, you know, now with, um, you know, a lot of, we do a lot of stuff with A-spheres and, you know, we have great machines like, uh, you know, the, the Murphs, you know, it's, it's come so far and not only that, but then there's the social aspect of it, I think has changed a lot. Right. I mean, back in the day, optic shops, I got to tell you, my experience, you know, we were allowed to, you know, we were working on, you know, with a lot of pitch and blocking and working together and you were doing most of the operations. And so I think, I think it's really come a long way. I, I know another thing, you know, I, I was basically groomed uh, and trained by German opticians and back in the seventies and eighties, they were tough and they had come out of the German pro apprenticeship programs. Those were great programs. And these guys that came over, they um, they knew what they were doing. And so that aspect of it was good because you really got a good foundation and they were very strict and they made your life miserable a little bit. And even back then, a lot of shops and we can get into this later in the conversation, but there wasn't a lot of sharing in optic shops. But even within your own optic shop, there was very people weren't willing to show you stuff and you, you kind of had to figure things out on your own. But now it's a wholly, totally different thing. You know, you, the sharing of information and you can go on the Internet. You know, you got to remember there was no Internet back then. And you can go and search all kinds of stuff and find answers to things. So it was it was a little tough. But, it, you know, if you really wanted to learn stuff, you had a, you figured out a lot of it on your own. Let me ask you this. So I, I just asked you about the shop and the correlation, obviously, is shop and technician. I like to think of this in terms of equations. And you have the Americom, Sussex County Community College dynamic uh, through Americom. Thor Labs is obviously involved in that. They've been involved with SCCC before, actually, the formation of the Americom partnership. But when we're talking about an optics workforce, in addition to technicianship in the shop, there's also quite a need for optical engineers. And we often have this discussion through a um, an academia first lens. You're an industry, I, I, you know, I, I suppose I don't have a question so much as I'm seeking your thoughts on that. The current state of the comprehensive need for the workforce. You know, I was thinking, I, I actually was thinking about something similar to that. You know, we have, I, I have a fella as a good example of, um, that I work with at Thor Labs, a fella named Dan Sapio. And Dan really started as a technician. He had been maybe, I, I, I don't remember exactly, but he maybe been in the Plano department or he was in um, uh, the, the blocking or grinding department. I, he, he moved around. But then he went from that stuff to conventional stuff. Then he went and he learned CNC. He went and learned the, the MRF stuff. And then he, you know, he wanted to get his engineering degree. So that's what he did. And, you know, I and I still see him. And when I visit New Jersey and I get to hang out with the, the guys over there, you know, he's still a, he's an engineer now, but he's. He's still got his hands in the machines and he's still making stuff. Um, so, you know, yeah, I agree with you that, you know, it's and that's the great thing about the precision optics business is that you can start, you know, at this point. But there's nothing there's nothing keeping you back from going from technician to engineering to being an entrepreneur. I mean, the possibilities are great, you know, like for me. I'll tell you, I didn't, I didn't, uh, my story is I didn't go to college. So, you know, I, I didn't know when I, when I was in that time, I was kicking around what I was going to do. I, I was a good student, but I, I wasn't thinking about college and, um, I graduated and I didn't even really have a plan, but, um, you know, after a couple of years and my father put some pressure on me, I, I certainly had to figure out something. And, and I think I mentioned to you, I answered an ad in the paper and I saw the word laser and I was like, oh, man, this sounds like something cool. But, you know, I look at a guy like myself. I'm extremely lucky. And I started out working for my my uncle in his gas stations. And, you know, here I am 45 years later and without a college degree, you know, working uh, as the uh, what am I? What's my title these days? Global optics director. <laughs> The possibilities are, are endless, and I think it's for anybody who – that's what I love about this this uh, optics and photonics thing. I mean, you can do anything you want. It, the, the possibilities are endless. 
I suppose you can really only speak about your own journey. I think that that's probably fair. Let's, for the sake of things, and you're here 45 years after you answer that ad in the paper, let's assume your path, or, or maybe more broadly, the path that a company like Thor Labs can put in place for someone in the field, young in the field. Let's call that a good model. What advice do you have uh, for technicians today about not just identifying the prospect of enhanced opportunity, but but sort of cultivating a path and moving towards a not even just an engineering position, but something beyond technician? Yeah, good question. I think continuing education, I think being well-rounded, I think watching what your boss is doing. You know, I know for me, I've had some great mentors through my career, basically three three people that mentored me, and I watched them and I, I realized that there were things that these guys were working hard and they they couldn't do everything. So I w- was kind of like watching them and I said, well, I think I can do this and help them out. And and that's one way of doing it. I think, like I said, continuing your education, you know, having having a vision for your your career. I mean, when you're and most companies do a yearly review, right? Um, I think you go into your when you when you sit down with the people that are are in charge or your your boss and you're you're being reviewed you know you you, you should go in there with a plan and talk about you know f- understand what the company needs and what you need as personal work development because first of all i've been through a lot of that over the years talking and and you know mentoring people and understanding what are the things that they need and what are the things that you know the company needs and i think if you take the time and you have a plan and you really think things through, I think, you know, that helps move things along. And, you know, at Thor Labs, I mean, especially now, um, I think, you know, over the last few years, we have a new president, uh, Jen Cable, in I think 2020 or 21. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for the first 30 years, basically Alex Cable was running everything and he's still the CEO of the company. But, you know, we were much more focused on the customer side of things and we still are but with you know over the last couple of years we've been you know i think equally focused on you know our workforce and our people and i think that's really been great for for thor labs and i see it throughout the industry so i you know i think there are plans in place and i think things are happening where you know there is a lot of opportunity to advance and to move along and to uh, you know thor labs as an example and i'm sure a lot of other companies do a pretty good job of this but making furthering your education no cost to you thor labs pays for that stuff if it's related to what we're doing, you know, we're going to take care of that. And I think a lot of people take advantage of that. Thor Labs has done a great job with that. And, and like I said, I see other companies doing just as well. We mentioned in our intro the Rochester Regional Photonics Cluster. When it comes to Americom and to workforce development, we'll call it the Rochester model. It's the gold standard in this space. One doesn't have to spend too long wondering why. People, industry buy-in, higher education programs, and even high school reach-out characterize this dynamic. On a broader scale, what makes the Rochester model function is also the confluence of factors that manifest as leadership. That, Malone says, is vital and worth replicating. You know, I, I think about that, and at the end of the day, it really comes down to leadership and people and community, and I think when you say leadership, you think about leaders and people who see the bigger picture, who understand what the ultimate win is or the goal is. I mean, I, lo- I always love the fact as being a New Jersey outsider, I always love the fact that those guys, they, they seem to all really get along and like each other and um, share stuff. I mean, let's not make a mistake about it. I mean, everybody has their business that they have to do and be responsible for. But I always really admired that about Rochester. And I think, you know, obviously there's a, such a deep history in Rochester going back to Corning and Kodak. You know, I I, I think the, the people who were back in the day that really led to put the groundwork down for all these optics companies in Rochester. And I just got a New York Photonics poster yesterday in the mail from Tom Bally. So Thor Labs is at the bottom and it says New Jersey. But um, (laughs) (laughs) 
But I, I think, you know, and then, of course, you got U of R there and you got the community college and you got that support. But I, at the end of the day, boy, I really think that it comes down to like people who really love the industry and people who understand the big picture. And it, it really is remarkable, I think, because, you know, and we all, you know, everybody has their little things and, you know, we're. You maybe have a little squabble here or there. You're not happy about something. But, uh, you know, I think for the most part, that's that's the real foundation that I see for New York Photonics and all those companies. And I as a comparison, you know, I I we New Jersey had Bell Labs. Right. So Bell Labs, a lot of companies sprung out of Bell Labs. And, you know, I worked at a few of them and there was not nearly as many uh, companies that there that there are in Rochester, but I felt like there were there was some cooperation uh, or coopetition, as the guys in Rochester like to call it, um, in New Jersey. But there wasn't a lot of that, you know. I, I have to say there wasn't a lot of that, and I but there was there was hope, uh, and for some of that, you know, one of the when I started my company back in 1998. Uh, you know, it was a bootstrap. I, it was a startup between me, Alex Cable, and this other fellow, Mike Skripsik. We were, we were a bootstrap, uh, bootstrap company. We didn't have a whole lot of money to do it at the time. But um, I think one of the things that really helped us early on was I struck up a friendship with this fellow, Jim Kapalakos, um, who was working at Optics for Research. And I was really the first time in my career that I I met somebody and who was very helpful, who, you know, I would call him up and we would talk for all kinds of stretches of time about how we're quoting jobs or what, you know, for, you know, what tools or things that were needed. And we certainly uh, started to share a lot of stuff. And, and I think that relationship the kind of relationship that I think a lot of the people in Rochester have and or, or certainly uh, had through the years. And that's a that's really a great thing. And I like I mentioned earlier, you know, there were there were people that within your own shop wouldn't share stuff with you, <laughs> you know. So I think that's a part a big part of, uh, you know, the success for the New York photonics people. And I mean, there's a lot more to it, I think. But I think that's the foundation and I love to be part of that. And another uh, group of people, Jim Sidor and Sidor Optics, that have been great partners through the years. And, you know, I can never say enough about those guys. You may be at the bottom there. Thor Labs may be at the bottom of the New York State Photonics poster, but Thor Labs, uh, rather recently now, has uh, found a uh, very real presence in Rochester through its acquisition of JML Optical. I want to get your thoughts on that, what that brings to Thor Labs. Yeah, boy, we're we are so excited about about this uh, acquisition. And, you know, one of the things for, you know, a company like Thor Labs and I'm sure other other catalog based companies like Edmund or I don't even know or the other uh, Newport, whatever. I think, you know, there's this always this tension between catalog versus OEM. And I think um, when we had the opportunity to look at a company like JML, you know, one of the thoughts I had was, was wow, you know, this could be really a, a nice arm for OEM in our business and in our company. You know, I we have a, a really nice, you know, I forget how many square feet. I think now it's up to 125,000 square feet of optic space in, in Newton. But there's always this tension between, you know, the catalog and the OEM and specials. And it's tr it's really hard to, to do it all on, under one roof. And I think back, you know, back nine or 10 years ago, um, when Thor Labs was, you know, we were doing OEM. We weren't really structured for it. We were so focused on the catalog. But I think what we did was we realized what we had to do and we needed to build out a structure. And we went and um, we looked to hire somebody that would understand that business and be able to do that for us. And we ended up hi hiring a fellow named Mike, Michael Mohammedy who has done a great job uh, of leading leading our global OEM. So, you know, when I look at the the JML acquisition, I think they come with some things that we we're not really doing in in Newton. You know, they do they do really great job with large optics. They have a really nice advanced uh, assembly group. They have the A cylinders like I had mentioned before. They also do um, 
which we love is the quick turn uh, optics cell, which, you know, I think we have to do some work there. We, back in the day, we were looking to do, um, we used to call it rapid prototyping. And we wanted to really build that out because we wa- we always felt like, you know, the catalog parts would get you 90% of the way and in your project. And then you needed to fill that gap, that 10% gap for your customer. And, um, and that was part of that thinking was, was having that rapid prototyping that can really provide solutions for our customers. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things that were attractive for the JML folks. And I've uh, been there a lot over the last couple of months. And I'm very, there's a great team in place. Um, Really, some really uh, people have been in the industry for quite a while, very talented, very passionate. There's a nice facility there. You know, for me personally, and for Thor Labs, we, you know, I have been wanting to be in Rochester for quite a while. There's no doubt that the optics industry and those within it have advanced significantly since 1978. In moving back to where we started our conversation with Malone, we asked if the 45-year industry veteran could put a bow on things by looking into his crystal ball to forecast the next 5, 10, 20, and 45 years for the field. That forecast takes into account the continued marketing of the industry and all it has to offer. I just was watching the news last night, and the the story was about um, how construction workers and plumbers and electricians are all desperate for people and they can't find people and they can't find new young people interested and when i hear stuff like that i go oh no because well i I wish them all luck in finding you know the people that work in those industries and and i and there, and listen, not everybody wants to work inside and people want to work outside or whatever they want to do. But I look at it as competition and competition. We're all we're all in competition for for talent. And I think that's going to be a really big part, a really big challenge for the optics and uh, photonics industry is to really get the word out on how cool our industry is. And on, on you can be working on state of the art uh, projects and equipment and really, you know, making a difference in society when it comes to so many different things. Right. I just think the, the possibilities are endless in the and at least in the marketing piece of that, you know, for photonics and optics to be healthy and and interesting for the future, you know, it's all about getting the message out because it's all really cool stuff. And I personally, uh, I've been working for over 45 years now. I've never worried about having a job. You know, I, 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 I kid around and tell people I could work in this business for three lifetimes because there's such a need for for people who uh, want to put the time in and do the work and really uh, make a difference. So I I see like the future for for optics and and my love too is particular to, you know, precision optics and and the stuff that we do. And I I see uh, a lot of people now that I either uh, know from other companies or people within Thor Labs that are, you know, really engaged. That kind of passion, that kind of urgency to get work done, uh, do interesting things in your life, I think is really important. And, you know, what's the saying, you know, if you love what you do, you never you never have to work a day in your life. Well, that's that's how I feel. I'm, I'm one of the luckiest guys that ever had a job in optics. That ever sat in front of a diamond turning machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, as always, appreciate your insights on a, uh, a range of topics spending Newton to Rochester, um, and a little beyond, of course. Great to speak with you, great to catch up with you, and we'll do it again soon. All right. Thanks, Jake. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.